Are you ready to receive the word? I don't know, Josh, was that enough to give it or not? Yeah. If one of you are ready, let's try it again. Are you ready to receive the word of God? All right, have it implanted within your soul, waken you and change you. I am. We're going to talk this morning about the perfect shepherd. The perfect shepherd. Do you know you have a shepherd? And he is perfect. I want to remind you of something. In four weeks when I retire, and by the way, some of you seem to be keeping count. I'm not sure why or what that means, but I will be preaching all of the next four Sundays, uh, at least through, what is it, the 29th of July. Uh, I'm sure Josh is glad to hear this. He's done a lot of preaching. Uh, I felt like I wanted you to get used to, to him while we were still uh, doing this uh, co-pastoring together. But if there's anything that I know about me over the last 50 years of, of preaching and pastoring, it's that this shepherd is not perfect. No laughter? <laughs> Some of you spent all 27 years with me here, uh, and the rest were in, in Orchard Park, but you know I'm not perfect, because there is no human perfect shepherd. They don't exist. So I, I'm, and Josh hasn't paid me to do this yet. Oh, <laughs> I want to remind you before he starts that that shepherd won't be perfect either. That shepherd won't be perfect. He'll do things that you'll get. Why'd he do that? Probably because he was led by the Holy Spirit to do it, right? <laughs> Once in a blue moon, even his wife will look at him and say, why did you do that? Yeah, she just rolled her eyes at me. Okay. Uh, human, perfect human shepherds don't exist. We're going to go through uh, several scriptures today. And I want to take you into Hebrews, the fifth chapter, just a few verses about priests. These are the words of the author of Hebrews and the book of New Testament book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 5 and uh, starting with verse 1 uh, through verse 3, very short passage. And it says, every high priest, we could substitute the word every pastor. And pastor really means shepherd. And those of us who pastor are simply under shepherds of the chief shepherd, Jesus. That's, that's what we are. We are his ambassadors from his heavenly kingdom. We do, hopefully, what he tells us to do. Whatever you, I, I remember when Andrew Young from Atlanta was the uh, ambassador to the United Nations, and he went to Africa, and he did something he was told not to do. And he was fired as an ambassador. It was a huge scandal. Uh, probably most of you don't even remember that, but that was a while ago. An ambassador is responsible to represent not just himself, but an ambassador represents the kingdom from which he came. Pastor Josh and I represent the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. And so we want to do what pleases God within that ministry. So it says, every high priest is selected from among men. God doesn't use angels to lead us. He uses men and is appointed to represent them in matters relating to God. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd takes the sheep's needs to God and he brings to the sheep God's word of life and healing and direction. That's a two-way street. That's what a shepherd does. So every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters to God to offer gifts. Now watch this next couple of verses. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. Now that was Old Testament theology. It was recorded in the New Testament. He's talking about high priests offering sacrifices. Our high priest who is... Jesus already offered the only sacrifice you need, and we celebrated it this morning, and what's it called? The death of Christ on Calvary. He was and is the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world for our sins. We can't pay the price for our sins. We can only receive the fact that Christ paid the price for our sins. 
So he goes on to say here, and I love this. Josh, this is to you and me. And the shepherd, the high priest, the pastor is able to deal gently. I have, after 50 years, I'm still working on that gently. Wow. He is able to deal gently with those who are, number one, ignorant. That doesn't mean they're stupid. That means they're ignorant of the Word of God. They don't know what the Word says, and so they sin because they're ignorant of the Word. And so he says he's able to deal with those who are ignorant of the Word and those who are going astray. Why? Since he himself is subject to weakness. The shepherds are subject to weakness. That's what Josh and I were talking about before the service this morning. I was saying, Josh, I know as a shepherd, as an under-shepherd of Christ, that I haven't arrived. Every day of my life as a reminder, I have not reached perfection yet. Every day I come to the end of the day, and sometimes only halfway through the day, and I say to myself, Gordon, that was so dumb. That was so wrong. What are you doing? Why did you do that? What's that? Yeah. Uh, and why can shepherds and pastors do what they do? And why can they feel compassionate for others? Because they're full of weakness themselves. They know what it's like to struggle with the feelings and the passions of, of the human mind and the soul and the spirit and not always do what's right. They know that. And so they take compassion on those around them. Since he himself is beset with weakness, this is why he has to offer, and we offer sacrifices of praise, Pastor Josh, for his own sins. Sorry to tell you, Josh, but I assume that just like me, you have sins that will need to be confessed and forgiven. <laughs> uh, and so he says, for his own sins, as well as the sins of the people, and no man takes this honor to himself. You need to hear something. Though God told me 22 years ago he was going to be your pastor, and he looked at me and said, no, no, I can't do that. I didn't appoint him. It was not my appointing. All I was doing is delivering the message that God gave to me prophetically. God said, I'm going to make him the next shepherd of this flock, the under-shepherd of Jesus. And so no man takes that honor on himself, but he must be called by God. He must be called by God. So there are no perfect human shepherds. By the way, if you're here today and you're not normally here, we have uh, up at the front here or at the back, we have copies of everything up here is right here on one sheet of paper. You can take it home with you if you want. And uh, that way you can enjoy the message and, and reread it uh, at your own leisure. So we go to... The verse. What do we know about shepherds? Well, everybody, if I ask you what the shepherd's psalm is, there's probably not a person here who wouldn't know what the shepherd's psalm is. What is it? Psalm 23. And what did David say in Psalm 23, 1? The Lord is my shepherd. I cannot have a want. Well, wait a minute. I got lots of wants. I want a million dollars. Well, that's not what it's talking about. He's saying there can't be a need in your existence that God, your shepherd, is not able to meet. Oh, how many times a day do we forget that? Do I forget that? We go through the day, we come to a hard time, we get discouraged or upset with ourselves or with people, and we forget that God is the shepherd. He's leading us. David made a choice, and, and uh, to each of us, I have to assume if, if you're here that you've made the choice. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. You can try and have people as your shepherd. You can try and get husbands or wives or bosses or friends or not just people, but possessions, uh, you know, wealth. You can try other shepherds, but I guarantee you no shepherd will fulfill the God-shaped vacuum in your soul the way Jesus will. It's that simple. And David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, what does that mean, the name Lord? If you go to the Hebrew, and I put the Hebrew up here for you, 
I've transliterated it in the, into English so you can read it, but the Lord is Jehovah, the correct pronunciation, or we call it Jehovah, Jehovah, Rohi. Now, Jehovah means the self-existent one, the one who before eternity began, if that's possible, already existed. And throughout all of the intercalation of time that we know as history, God existed. And throughout all of eternity in the future, He will always exist. He is the self-existent one. He didn't go to a bank and take out a loan and, and say, I need to build me a universe. I need some collateral. I need some resources. Give me something. He was self-existent. And Hebrews 11.1 1 says, he spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke the universe came into existence like that. Wow. He spoke. He's the self-existent one. But he's Jehovah. Rohi. Rohi means shepherd. We're going to look at what means to be a shepherd, but he is a self-existent shepherd. Trust me. Well, I hate that when people say, trust me. First thing you know is I probably shouldn't trust them, you know. <laughs> trust me when I tell you this. You don't want a human pastor as your chief shepherd because they will fail you regularly. You want the chief shepherd, Jesus, as your shepherd. Does that make sense? And Josh is going, all the weight's off of me and back on Jesus, right? <laughs> Amen. So, how do you know that God shepherds and what does that mean? Listen to what he wrote through the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah 40, verse 11. He, referring to Jehovah Rohi, Jesus, God, the shepherd. He feeds the flock. He feeds the flock. Now, that's an agricultural uh, illustration. If you've got sheep, you know the sheep have to be fed. If you've got cattle, you know the cattle need to be fed. If you've got grapes, you feed them with fertilizer and all kinds of good things um, that are legal these days, and, uh, and, and they grow. God feeds his flock. You are the flock of God. If you've received Jesus, you are the flock of God. He will feed you. He will feed you. How many of you think God knows how to cook? <laughs> you know, uh, because my dad was a chef and my mom was a, a really good cook, uh, and they never cooked the same time in the kitchen, ever. Couldn't get along that well. <laughs> uh, but I learned how to cook, so I can cook fairly well, you know. And I like a variance in my meals. I like steak and lobster, and I like, you know, grits for breakfast. And I like all kinds of strange things. But I like a variance within my meals. God knows that you need a variance in your spiritual diet. Those of you who don't regularly come here, God brought you here to feed you. Just want you to know that. You're welcome to sit at our table anytime. Put your feet right under the table of the Lord. You're at home. Uh, come anytime. You can even drive from Florida if you want. That's fine. Yeah. Although you're moving here right now. <laughs> he feeds his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs. He literally picks up the lambs. Do you know that sheep... First of all, ask any agriculturalist and they'll tell you sheep are dumb animals. They'll, go, they'll literally walk over a cliff to get a tuft of grass out of their reach. That's why a shepherd's staff has a crook at the end. The crook is to reach down and to pull the shepherd, uh, excuse me, pull the sheep out of that area where he never should have been together uh, at all and where he went without the shepherd's you know, agreement without the shepherd's instruction. So he gathers his lambs, his young sheep. We've got young sheep in the other room, and he's teaching them. We're the older sheep. 
You know. He gathers them in his arms. Why do I hug? You come in the early morning, I hug everybody who walks through the building just about. Why? Because God gathers his sheep in his arms. We got this sterile society that says, well, don't touch me. And literally, we become cold and, uh, and dry inside. Folks need to be touched. I'm tactile. I put my hands on your shoulder. I hug you. Why? Because I want you to know the shepherd is holding you. And I'm not talking about the under-shepherd. I'm talking about the chief shepherd. He's got you in his arms. He's not an absentee landlord that created it all and walked away. He is here with you every moment of your life. He gathers you within his arms. He carries you where if he's holding you here, he says, you're close to my heart. You're close to the heart of God. God says, I've got you. My heart is for you. My heart is for you. I, I, before I go through that, i got to read. I love this song. Just heard it, I think, at the prayer meeting when we prayed for the nation a couple of months ago the first time. Reckless love. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You've been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life into me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights me until I'm found. Leaves the ninety and nine. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, still you, your love fought for me. In other words, when I struggled, and I did, don't love me. Don't just. I don't want to be spiritual. I don't want to be religious. I don't want to this or that or the other thing. Just let me go to church on Sunday and leave me alone. Or just leave me alone, period. When I was your foe and I still fought your, uh, still you fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so kind to me. There's no shadow you won't light up. There's no mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. What does a shepherd do more than anything else? It's the number one goal of the shepherd. Get ready, Josh. So simple. He loves the sheep. He loves them with all of his heart. Under shepherds, we don't do it so perfectly. We mess up at times. But the chief shepherd loves you perfectly. And we strive to be like him. I, I've been told I'm a handful. <laughs> I've been told I'm, I'm tough to handle. I just don't quit. I just keep coming back. Because that's the nature of my God. He never stops telling us He loves us. Never stops. There's no wall He won't, there's no lie He won't tear down. There's no wall He won't kick down. There's, I mean, there's the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God is coming to get you. That'll knock you off your kilter. It really will. But I don't want to be loved by somebody who says, well, okay, if you want to love me, all right. I want to be loved by somebody who is not taking no for an answer. Somebody who's knocking down walls and kicking down doors to get to me to say, I love you. What can I do for you? How can I help you? That's the love that's in my heart. That's the nature of the love that God has put within every believer's heart. That's what we need to do. The last part of that verse... I don't do so well in this sometimes. He gently leads those that have young. 
there's still enough Baptist in me that I'm a fighter. I don't even like that. I don't think that's, I don't mean Baptist or Baptist. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, I'm simply saying that they're, they're natural born, you know, they just tend to be adversarial at times. God says, I want you to be gentle as you lead. Fifty years in the pastorate, I'm still learning that. Still learning to be a gentle shepherd. Why? Confession time. Can the pastor come to confession? Because our ego is involved. Sometimes our human ego is involved and we begin to think we're responsible and we've got to do this or we've got to do that. And so we begin to take ownership when God says, whoa, I own. This has never been my church. Ever. It's Christ's church. And for a shepherd to ever take ownership is dangerous. God will either straighten you out quick or he'll remove you. One or the other. He gently leads those who have young. Okay, why is it not forwarding? It's blinking. Thank you. I'll let you take care of it. (laughs) Jesus is our shepherd. What does the scripture say about that? Number one, it says he's the good shepherd. John chapter 10 and verse 11 and verse 14 says he's the good shepherd. You wonder, well, God is the shepherd of my life. How is that going to work out? Is he a good shepherd or is he kind of a rough shepherd? Jesus is a good shepherd. How do you know he's a good shepherd? Because he lays down his life for the sheep. There isn't anything, just sang that song, there isn't any wall he won't knock down, any, you know, the whole song. Everlasting, reckless love of God. There isn't anything he won't do. He gave his life for you. How do you know somebody means you well when every chance they get, they lay down their life for you? It's that simple. He died for you and me left the throne of heaven, became human, and said, we said, how much do you love us, Jesus? And he stretched out his arms and he died. I love you this much. I love you this much. He's the great shepherd. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20 says that he's a great shepherd because he not only gave his life for us, but he has put together an everlasting covenant. You can't step outside the covenant of God. It is everlasting. Wow. And then it it goes on to say that he's made this covenant through the blood that he shed at Calvary. We partook of communion this morning. We drank the juice representing the blood of Christ. What we were saying was we belong to the kingdom of God. And we have a covenant with the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are God's kids. And you can face nothing that God won't get you through. Nothing. I love, uh, Billy Graham once called the Holy Spirit, and he said it very affectionately. Billy Graham once called the Holy Spirit the hound of heaven. You can run as fast and as far as you want away from God. He'll get you. He's going to get you. Because the Holy Spirit of God is coming after you. The Apostle Paul said, I, I have not yet apprehended. This is, this is me at 50 years of pastoring. I have not yet apprehended that which I have been apprehended for. Does that make sense? He says, I called you to be a shepherd and you haven't reached perfection yet, Gordon. However, you have been apprehended and you've done certain things that are good and I'm pleased with those good things. You've been apprehended, brother, by God. And by the blood of the everlasting covenant, we have a relationship with God. He is the chief shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 4, or chapter 5 and verse 4. The chief shepherd is preparing us so that when we get to heaven, 
you will be worthy of an eternal crown that will not fade. The glory of that crown will not fade. You think, well, I've never done anything for God. Or maybe you think, well, other people have done so much more. I've got news for you. God says, I have an eternal crown for you. An eternal crown. And the glory of that crown will not fade away. Even in glory, even in heaven, God will bless you and honor you. Thank you. What do shepherds do? Primarily, they love the sheep. Understand that Jesus is your shepherd. You've chosen him and that he loves you more than anything. You can't imagine the depth of his love and where he won't go to give you what you need. I got to tell you, there are times when God says, Gordon, you need this. I say, I don't need that. I need this. God says, oh, I I created you. How do you know what you need? (laughs) I am learning. I would not say I have learned. I am learning that the shepherd's directions are always best. You see, that's called the owner's manual. He owns my soul. He created me. So primarily what the shepherds do is they love the sheep. But number one, they're protectors from all enemies. From all enemies. They protect them from the wolves. It's one of the reasons the shepherd's staff is made out of such hard wood so he can literally beat away the wolves that come after the sheep. He's not going to let the wolves get to the sheep. And then he does something as as wonderful. Think about this. The shepherd puts an anointing on the head and on the ears of the sheep, and it keeps the flies away. Isn't that neat? You ever seen cows and they got flies all over them and they use their tail and they're squishing, trying to get rid of the flies or the crows or what's ever on their back? The shepherd anoints the head and the ears of the sheep so that no flies get to them. In the Bible, the flies refer to temptation. I love this. God says, I have anointed your ears to hear what you need to hear and your head to think clearly so that you avoid temptation. Wow. Is that good or what? That's what God does for us as a shepherd. He protects us. He's a provider. Shepherds provide. They feed and care for the sheep. We don't know where the best food is, but the shepherd does. He knows where the best food is. And so he cares for us and feeds us. Providential guides. Shepherds are providential guides. They wisely lead the sheep to where they need to be. The shepherd has a plan He knows exactly where the green grass is to take the sheep. He doesn't take them out into the desert. He takes them to where, and Psalm 23 says it, beside the still waters and in the green pastures. Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. If you will follow the shepherd, and sometimes we rebel against the shepherd. If you'll follow the shepherd, there'll be green pastures and still waters. It'll be a great place of blessing to you if you just follow the sheep or follow the shepherd. He wisely leads them to where they need to go. Last one. John chapter 10. We could take an hour and go through John chapter 10. I'm going to take just a few seconds. The shepherd's chapter in the New Testament. Jesus is the shepherd of his sheep. Who's the shepherd of your soul? If you haven't, and I assume you have, but if you haven't invited Jesus to be the shepherd of your soul, you need to do that immediately because the blessing comes from him being your shepherd. Verses 1 through 3. Verses 3 through 4, he calls them by name. He knows you. He's got you. It's interesting. God said to Adam, you name the animals. Can you imagine how smart Adam must have been to name all the genus and phyla names of all of the animals that that were ever alive when he was there. How intelligent was Adam? So 
He named them. But God said, I named the stars. Every one of the constellations, God says, I named. And you go through and you look at the names of the constellations. Virgo, the virgin. Mary, who brings forth and ushers forth the child. Leo, the uh, the lion, then you've got the, the Taurus, the bull and the lion together. All speak prophetically of Christ. We don't have time to get into that, but it's, it's all there. Verse 5, the sheep, if you have Jesus living inside you as the shepherd, then you shouldn't be following anybody or anything else. Does that make sense? They will never follow a stranger. 6 through 10, he, Jesus, is the gate we enter to be saved that word, that's the word sozo. It means that God delivers us from destruction. The destruction of hell itself, but also the destruction we bring on ourselves as we don't listen to the shepherd. Wow. He is the gate and enter, we enter in to be saved and find fellowship with God. 11 through 18, he knows his sheep and they know him. When I get messed up in my head, you, you don't ever get messed up in your head, do you? When I get messed up in my head and it wants to go the wrong direction and I start listening to this instead of the shepherd, it says that God the shepherd speaks to us and says, don't, don't, don't do that. Do this. He's a still, small, gentle voice, but we need to listen. And the more we listen to the voice of the gentle shepherd, the more loud it becomes and the more clearly we hear to know where to go and what to do. I want to read for you in closing uh, John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. Amazing passage of Scripture, and I will close with this. Twenty-seven. John 10, 27. My sheep listen to my voice. Are you a sheep of God? For your own sake, listen to his voice. My sheep know my voice. They hear me. And I know them. Ephesians 1 says, He's known you since eternity past. He created you in his mind from eternity past. I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Life in heaven with God forever and ever. In a perfected state. Not like this. In a perfected state. Now listen to this. Powerful. And I want to leave this with you about the shepherd. They shall never perish. Ever have fears about what happens when I go into eternity? If Jesus is your shepherd, you will never perish. Now, my word's his. And he says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. Imagine the tired, the tight grip of God. Jesus said, no one can take you out of God's hands. No one. You are secure in the hand of God. My Father, who has given them to me, the sheep, us, is greater than anyone else. He's greater than all. Now listen to this. No one, again, can snatch them out of my hand. And I and my Father are one. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Don't live in fear ever. Fear messes me up quicker than anything. I'll just say that. I'm only here for four more weeks, so I can say whatever I want, right? Fear messes me up more than anything. Fear, which has to do with pride. Awful things, awful things. God says, you listen to me, and you'll be okay. And by the way, he says, it's not on you, it's on me. Nothing shall ever remove you from the hand of God. Not the angels of heaven, not the demons of hell, not anybody else, not the dumb, stupid things you and I do. Nothing will ever remove you from the hand of God. He's got you.
I can't think of a better message to leave you with. There is no better message. He's got you. Shepherd's got you.